right? We're going to be using this for intro to vet tech. We're using this for patient care. But in the fall, for didactic, we are going to get more into the science part of the radiologic sciences. So that class is called PRE, Principles of Radiographic Exposure. And so PRE will be using a different book. It is the Johnston and Fallberg book. It's on the book list, I think. Is it on, is it on the book list? Uh, I don't know if it was, was it already part of the original book list? I, I don't recall seeing it. Mm -hmm. Is that so is that book? Uh, it's your PRE slash physics book. Is it like green? Um, it is blue. Oh. blue. So is that the yeah, only so. Yeah, pull it up for me, please. I remember saying, <laughs> like, hey, if you could drop that picture to the group chat. It's just one. Oh, yeah, we got two. Yeah. Okay, one. Whoa. It's this book right here. So it was 127. So Dr. Johnston and Dr. Faber. Is there any more books after this as well? Yes, after this. books after this. <laughs> so that's the only additional one we'll need for fall. For right. fall. Yeah. So we got to get a name. That's all we want to say. Um, that might take a while for it to come okay. in. Yeah, that's true. I still have a copy book. I can't recall off the top of my head if that's the only additional book we'll need for fall. Okay. That is something I would need to check on. Okay. Thanks. Sounds right. I'm about to order a whole new one. If you like, ship it never came in. What's the other one? Do you have any classes in lab in the fall? Um, so classes and lab in the fall, yes. So basically in the fall, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you'll be here at Fornis, and I'll be teaching you all PRE and pathology. Thursday, Thursdays, you'll be in the clinical setting working with technologists. One day a week, either Tuesday or Thursday, you will also be with either myself or Ms. Bonilla in lab. And lab will still be. Lab will still be. I don't have an answer for you right now. I will get back to you. Like that. So, we will have. We still have the room at LBJ for lab. I do not know if we will be utilizing any other rooms for lab, so I don't want to say anything. Yes, John. Since the clinical group split, in, they're split into two, right? And group A goes two weeks, and then the next group goes after that, is that how it is? No, mm -hmm. so what happens is that of the 16 people in here, eight of them will be going through a Ben cut and tall cycle. Eight of you will be going through an LBJ cycle, right? Then talk, right? The hospital location has some clinics associated with it, has different locations, different departments associated with it. LBJ has its own departments and clinics associated with it. So in the fall, as part of the Bentop cycle, you might go through Bentop name, Bentop bone clinic, Bentop portables, Bentop operating room. Bentop Interventional Radiology. You might go through Smith Clinic. You might go through MLK, right? Associated with Bentop as well. Mm -hmm. LBJ site, you would be an LBJ main, EC, OR, portables, things like that. And LBJ would also have other clinics like Aldine that are associated with it. So you will be rotating through that area for the semester. Spring semester comes, You'll swap. If you're in LBJ, you'll move to Bentop. If you're in Bentop, you'll move to LBJ. Every semester, you just switch back and forth. That way, you will gain experience at both sites and all of those outlying clinics as well. So all of it, all eight of us will be going together this now? Not necessarily. Some of you will be at the actual Bentop site. Some of you will be at clinics associated with Bentop. Same thing for LBJ. Some of you will be at the LBJ site, some of you will be at clinics associated with LBJ. And we'll go over this as well um, at the beginning of fall when we do our fall orientation. Right? We'll get you all up to speed as to uh, how the clinics work. Okay, any other questions? So, so each student 
get to go to each area that every student will go? Correct. It may not be in that semester, but eventually you will get to visit every single location. When will we know our groups? For next semester? Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we send out the syllabus for next semester. Mm. Is it, and there'll be a break between this, this, this summer and the fall semester. Yes, you have a one week break between summer and fall. Right. One week mm -hmm. So get your money out. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to work for a week so I can afford these damn books. <laughs> now, um, we did get to discuss a bit about Chapter 5 on Wednesday. Are there any questions from that lecture? Or are we okay to move on? So we talked a bit about the clinical setting. Right, we talked about um, learning outcomes, learning objectives. This important part, clinical progression, how I expect you to move through clinic, right? Observe first, then assist, and then actually do. Supervision, very important for you to know. This is how your tech will be monitoring you. Assessment, policies, and this is where we stopped on Wednesday. So, any questions so far? In that case, let's talk about the radiology team. Right? So, at the hospital, right, we want to try and make sure that the department works together as a team. To do that, there are multiple initiatives, one of them being team steps. Right? The team steps stand for team strategies and tools to enhance performance and patient safety. There are five key ideas. So, idea number one, right, is that for, for teamwork, we first need a team structure. Right? So we need to know who is responsible for what. Okay, so you've got the leadership, and then you have um, the ones that the leadership are over, right, the ones that they are supervising. Um, you have communication. Communication is structured for accuracy and clarity. Right? Communication is important between team members because that is how you know what is going on. And that is how you get important information. So communication should be clear, it should be short, it should be concise. Right? Don't think that you have to fluff up your communication, make it sound smart, make it sound flowery. Right? The important thing is that whoever is reading or listening or receiving your communication, they understand what you are trying to get across. Leadership, the role of leadership in a team is to make sure that the team knows about any changes and that the team has the resources to do their job. Right? So if a higher up decides to, cut, to change a policy, the leadership of the department should be the ones to inform everyone about that change. Right? That is how everyone stays up to date. And of course, if the department needs anything, it is up to leadership to make sure that the department gets those resources. Right? Whether it's something simple like gloves, cleaning supplies, or something more fancy like new equipment, right? or even dealing with pay and compensation, it's up to leadership to make sure the team has those resources. Okay. Situation monitoring, it's important for the team to be attentive to the functions and circumstances of the team. Right? So be able to monitor the circumstances or the situation of the team. And finally, of course, mutual support. The team should support each other. So everyone is in this together. We're all working together. So we should all be helping each other out. We shouldn't all be trying to go our own separate ways. We shouldn't be trying to stick to ourselves. We should be trying to work together as a group. 
Okay, support each other. You support me, I support you. So is this chapter nine? This is chapter five. This is chapter five, but I don't see this picture in the book. So. The picture doesn't have to come from the book. <coughs> oh, That's the whole purpose of the PowerPoint. <laughs> Just, or, sorry. That's the whole purpose of me, right? Because if all you needed was the book, then I'm kind of useless, and I'm just going to read the book to you. Right? And, then, and no one needs me to do story time with them, right, with the book. So my job here is to try and find additional things, like this nice picture here, that hopefully makes this a little bit more easy to digest. So you're going to give us these PowerPoints, right? <laughs> like the book. Then we, then we can concentrate on a lecture and not worry about drawing. At the end of the unit, I will send out the PowerPoint. Okay. But you should still be reading ahead, taking your own notes, right? Because you should be trying to stay ahead of this information. And then at the end, you take your notes compared to what I have in my PowerPoint, and then you can make sure that you have everything accurate. So, teamwork. Now, as far as communication goes, how do we structure communication for accuracy and clarity? For that, we have SBAR. SBAR stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. This is a communication method that is organized, right? That way, information is always structured in the same way. We get the information in the same order every time. It cuts out all of the fluff. It's just situation, background, assessment, recommendation. It keeps it nice, short, simple. So, situation, that's part. What is the situation? What is going on? Background, what is the background of this situation? The clinical background of the patient. Assessment, what is the problem? that I'm trying to solve. And then recommendation. What am I recommending or requesting to be done? So, in the hospital setting, right, if I'm talking to a doctor and I need something from the doctor, or I'm talking to my manager and I need something from my manager, I will try and go through SBAR so that I brief them on what is going on, how we got here, what the issue is, and what needs to be done. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So let's give this a try. Let's say that we have a doctor. This doctor has ordered an x-ray for the patient. But the nurse says that the patient is unstable and cannot go down to the x-ray department. You want to check the doctor to see if we can do some alternative method of getting the x-ray. We, we can get the x-ray without having to bring the patient down to the department. So, how would you approach the doctor? Using SBAR, how would you structure your communication when you talk to the doctor? So, let's see. Um, who do I want to pick on today? Um, Shemeika. So, I want you to pretend that you're the one trying to talk to the doctor. Pretend I'm the doctor. Okay. Then you want to ask if you can do something else other than bring the patient down to the x-ray department. How would you pro approach me to ask for that? First, like if you identify the situation, let them know what's going on with the patient. Right. So I'm the doctor, go ahead and talk to me. Oh, okay. Hey, Dr. Chong. How are you doing today? Great. How are um, you? Uh, uh, who are you again? Sorry. Oh, I'm Shemaika. I'm the X-ray technologist. I was gonna say tech. Um, I have John Doe in room 112. Uh, I'm unable to do his, yeah, his chest X-ray. Uh, he's he's unstable. Is there any other? Yeah. Other exam that we can do? All right, great. So let's take a look at what Shemeika did, right? So first, right, she 
you try to explain the situation. It's like, okay, I've got this patient in this room, right? The patient is John Doe, he's your patient. Okay. And then, patient is unstable, can't do the x-ray, right? We're really, that's our assessment, right? Patient is unstable, that's the problem, can't do the x-ray. So, I'm requesting, can we do anything else? Okay. So, that's pretty good, that is pretty good. Okay. So, would anyone else like to give that a try? Hey, yes. Now let me go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Fong. How are you doing today? Great, great. Who are you again? I'm Melanie, the radio. 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 Picture is good. Okay. Right? Short, <laughs> simple. Oh. Oh. All right. So, do you want to type in here, Jay? Uh, sure. Hi, Dr. Fong. Hello. Um, Hi. So, um, where are you from? My name is Jay. I'm a radiologist. Uh, radiologist. Okay. <laughs> 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 I am a radiographer. Radiographer, okay. That is. <laughs> Uh, it is. with your patient. So, uh, he's unable to come downstairs to the radio uh, radio radiography room to be x-rayed. Is there any way I can bring the portable x-ray machine to him or uh, any other recommendations from his <coughs> physician? All right, great. So, what Jay did, right? He, um, rather than asking what can be done, he gave a suggestion here, right? Use a portable x-ray machine, perhaps. Okay, so, very good there. So, um, if I was going to do this, right? So, for me, okay, I would approach the doctor, okay? For example, um, Dr. Parekh, right? And, hey, so, uh, excuse me, Dr. Parekh. Yes, uh, sir. Morning, my name is Wilson. I'm coming from the x-ray department. I have, an x-ray that you've ordered for patient John Doe. Um, it's a chest x-ray because you are looking for a shortness of breath and chest pain. However, the nurse has told me, or the nurse has informed me that the patient is unstable and unable to come down to the x-ray department. Would it be possible for us instead to do a portable one view chest x-ray? Would that give you the same information you need? Or would you like us to delay this x-ray until the patient is more stable? No, Mr. Fang, we, I don't think we can delay the uh, x-ray, but, um, but since his, his condition demands us to get the x-ray right away, um, and we need a full image of the thing, so maybe you can bring up a portable um, x-ray to his room and take his extra. All right, very good. Good job, Dr. Good job, Dr. <laughs> so, right, situation, okay. I have your patient here, right? They have an x-ray background, right? So what is going on with the patient, right? Doctors have lots of patients. It's good to just give them a reminder as to what they ordered, right? So you ordered this chest x-ray for these reasons. It was the problem. Well, we can't get this x-ray done because of X, Y, Z. In this case, it's because the nurse said, right, patient is unstable, cannot come down to the department. Recommendation, I am recommending or requesting some things. So I've got some alternatives in mind that I can try out. Right? We could do a portable, kind of like what Jay said earlier. We could try and delay the procedure until the patient is more stable. Or perhaps the doctor has something else that they would like to try. So, we're gonna give our recommendation based on our knowledge, our experience, and see if the doctor is okay with it. Sometimes the doctor is looking for something very specific, and so they'll say, no, 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 I really need it done this way, right? And that's good information to have, because now you can use that to kind of reformulate your response, right? You go through your problem solving again, take this new information, and see how that changes your potential solution. So that is the idea of SBAR. 
Yes. Hey, uh, Mr. Fong, just a question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Back when I worked uh, in the ER. Yes. Um, oh, thanks. Um, sometimes, you know, it's kind of weird. I think that they would put an order in for an x-ray, mm -hmm. and maybe when they would look at it, maybe it wasn't exactly what the doctor had wanted. So it kind of... It kind of seems strange. It, it, sometimes the tech would actually come down to the doctor and they would just kind of tell them what is it that you need or that you want to see so mm -hmm. we can put the right order in. Yes. How common is that? How common is that? Um, <laughs> it is not uncommon. I, I have seen that before. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, especially if you're dealing with a new doctor or a resident that's straight out of medical school, they will have learned something that we don't really do as much anymore in the department, or they may not be certain exactly how to get what they want. For example, sometimes they'll be looking for fractures in the face, and they learn, okay, well, you can order an x-ray to look for fractures in the face, without knowing that the hospital, for example, their protocol is not to just do a CT scan instead. Mm. Right? So then you just go to the doctor and say, Hey, you know, um, I saw you ordered this x-ray on the patient, but normally when we have this kind of diagnosis or reason for exam, the patient would go to CT instead. So you could approach the doctor, the doctor like that, or what I used to do was I would check the radiologist. Because if the radiologist is willing to read the image, then okay, sure, I'll go ahead and do it. But if the radiologist says, no, 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 we do CTs now, then they'll be the ones to inform the doctor, the ordering doctor. Um, but yeah, sometimes it would be like the doctor is looking for knee pain, right? And depending on if they're looking for acute trauma versus if they're looking for arthritis, the way you set up the knee would be different as well. So sometimes they would put in the wrong knee order and then we would call them and ask them to confirm the reason for exam and suggest that they choose a different one instead. So yes, that will occasionally occur. It's okay to tell the radiologist that a patient has come in, but he's saying he's complaining about pain in the left leg instead of the right leg. So don't bother the radiologist with that. That will go directly back to the ordering doctor. So if the doctor orders left leg, patient comes to the department, we do our ADIP, Okay, so which leg is bothering you today? Oh, it's my right leg. So nothing wrong with your left leg? No, nothing wrong with my left leg. At that point, we would call the doctor, the ordering physician, and say, okay, I see that you've ordered the left leg. Patient says they're complaining about right leg pain. Do you still want us to do the left leg, or would you like to change the order? Okay. Don't tell them to change the order, but ask them if they want to change the order because Sometimes they do want the opposite leg. Sometimes they'll tell you, well, we've already gotten some pictures of the right leg before. I want pictures of the left leg to compare, right? So it may not be a mistake. So, so you won't be annoyed with your first seat. Oh, doctors will, jump, so doctors will get annoyed with you. Doctors <laughs> will get annoyed with you if you ask them questions sometimes. Not all doctors, but some will. Some doctors, doctors are people, right? Some people are nice, some people are rude. There was one time when I called a doctor. Um, once again, it was, uh, I think it was about a knee x-ray, and it was for acute pain. But normally, with acute pain, we think trauma, patients should be laying down for the knee x-ray. Doctor ordered standing up. So I called him, it's like, hey doc, um, so I see that you've got this knee x-ray order. It says acute pain normally. Um, for standing x-rays, we only do that for arthritis. Did you want us to do this laying down instead? But it's like, you know acute pain can come from arthritis, right? Damn. <laughs> you know what, Sensei? <laughs> right? like, you know acute pain can come from arthritis. Damn. <laughs> right, so, okay, at that point, all right. I'll just do what is written on your request, right? You did your job. You try to clarify, right? Doctor told you, nicely or rudely, that they wanted what they ordered, so I just went ahead and did it. So you, you documented, okay. documented, check, check, check. Hmm? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. just document, okay, check with Dr. So-and-so, 
Yes, we will do this one of right. Oh, but you didn't write that you gave your. No, I didn't write <laughs> that you gave your time. No. <laughs> it's, not, it's not nice to write. I mean, you can. I mean, yes, you can report doctors for unprofessionalism, right? but you wouldn't do that in your report, your documentation. That would be separate. Yes, Jay. So if a doctor requests something and um, it's something that you uh, either can't get done or you believe there to be some sort of mistake or maybe a mix up, mm -hmm. you refer to that doctor and go, hey, like, you know, what's going on here or whatever. And then um, they, let's say they take your advice and they ask or they request a different sort of x-ray. Mm -hmm. Or and let's say they do the after the fact and they um, didn't quite get what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. We're still exposing that patient to a good amount of radiation. Like, does that go past Alara at that point? Like, uh, as low as reasonably whatever. Um, like, yeah, like the, how did how does uh, if X-ray uh, exam was justified, then no. Right, if the X-ray exam was justified, then no, that would not be breaking Alara. Okay. Now, if for example. You got a request for a patient, you didn't read it carefully, you went and shot the patient's left foot, and then right as you finish, you look at the request and say, oh, it's the right foot. Mm. And then you go and you shoot the patient's right foot. Mm. Right? Are you breaking Alara by doing the right foot? No. But you did break Alara by doing the left foot because that was unnecessary. Right. Right? So if the exam is justified, it's not breaking Alara. If it is unjustified, then Yes, you have unnecessarily radiated your patient. Okay. And justification is only if the physician requests that specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Have they ever put like the wrong or completely wrong body part for you? Um, I don't think they've ever put the completely wrong body part, but they have ordered additional body parts. Mm -hmm. So for example, there may have been a patient who came in just for a hand x-ray, but then I said the patient's like, well, I mean, it is my hand, but really, I actually came in for my elbow because that's hurting even more. Call the doctor, they're like, okay, you know what? Hand, wrist, forearm, elbow x-rays. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And then we just do some additional x-rays because that's what the doctor wants. But uh, I don't think I've ever had a doctor order the completely wrong part or mix up patients or anything like that? Um, I do not believe I've had a doctor mix up any patients on me, <laughs> thankfully. Have you ever cool. mixed up Have I ever mixed up a patient? <laughs> yes, when I was a student. <laughs> so, this is a, this is a learning story, right? Mm -hmm. As a student, my very first semester of clinical rotation, mm -hmm. I think probably maybe my third rotation, my tech told me, all right, Go into the waiting room, get this patient. I go in. All right, uh, Mr. Jose Rodriguez. Guy stands up, comes up to me. I, I'm like, okay, uh, are you Mr. Jose Rodriguez? Like, mm. okay. um, and I was like, can you tell me your name? Jose Rodriguez. Right? Uh, can you tell me your birthday? Okay, well, I didn't know Spanish either, so I was like, all right, well, uh, you know what, here, here, come with me, come into the room. Okay. <laughs> Get there, I was like, so did you check the patient's information? Like, oh, yeah, this is, this is Dave Rodriguez. I was like, all right, uh, hold on, L let me, let me uh, check as well. Turns out it's the completely wrong patient. Name wasn't even Jose Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> right? He just answered and followed me. Right? Just wanted to get himself done, I suppose. Right? <laughs> Luckily, my tech caught that, right? I hadn't done proper aided, I hadn't done my proper patient identification. Right? So that was on me, right? That was my fault for grabbing the wrong patient. Okay. So luckily I did not end up doing end up did not end up x-raying that patient. Right? Luckily my tech did catch me. But hopefully that will not happen to any of you because you will all do your proper patient identification. Even if a patient says that they are who you're looking for and they follow you. Make sure you do all your steps, right? Name, date of birth, and arm band, right? All three. Um, 
So now we're going to look at this from more of a bird's eye view. We've been concentrating on radiology, but now we're going to pull ourselves back and look at the healthcare system as a whole. Because it's important we know how the hospital itself is organized. And in addition to hospitals, also how clinics kind of connect to this as well. So we've got a bunch of people related to the hospital. Operation of the departments is overseen by regulating agencies that are over the hospital itself. So just like how our school has JSER, and just like you as individuals have the ARRT, the hospital also has organizations that are monitoring it. And so it's important to know what employers are looking for from prospective team members as well. But if you understand the hospital system, then it's a lot easier to get into the hospital system. So, hospital leadership. The hospital has a board of directors. They operate the hospital overall. They give it its general direction. And they assign a CEO, the chief executive officer. So the CEO or the president right, of the hospital. In the case of Harris Health, we have Dr. Esmel uh, Porsa. He is our current CEO. So his job is to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the hospital. Right, so he's more involved in the details and the minutia compared to the board of directors. So he determines how the operation of the hospital is conducted and maintained. Along with the CEO, on kind of equal standing, we have the medical staff. So the CEO is over the hospital operations, but the doctors are kind of separate. Right? So in our case, here ourself, the Baylor and Beauty Health physicians, they are not working under the CEO. Okay, so they are not under the CEO, but they do communicate with the CEO. Right? So if I was an X-ray tech, right, I would have a supervisor, would have a director, would have someone else would have someone else who would be under the CEO. Right, so I'm under all these people who are under the CEO. But if I was a doctor, if I was a physician, then I'm not necessarily under the CEO. I'm gonna be kind of separate from that system. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right, so the doctors have their own hierarchy. What is, what is that called? Uh, what do you mean? Like above doctors, you said they have their own like a CEO or um, so I don't know if so I don't believe doctors have CEOs or anything like that but you do have kind of the leadership of your respective departments so you'll have somebody who's going to be in charge of orthopedics you'll have somebody that's going to be in charge of family medicine someone in charge of internal medicine someone in charge of pediatrics um, depending on how it's structured, they may all be under a chief medical officer mm. or something like that. So it's a department chair. Or a department chair. Mm -hmm. So the yes. that they are not under the CEO, mm -hmm. does that make them, like, that's not their boss? Right, so mm -hmm. Dr. Porsa is not the boss of the physicians. Oh, okay. But he's our boss's boss. Boss, his boss. Yes, so for us here at the school, he is over one of the VPs who is over Mr. Reed, who is over Dr. Black, who is over Mr. Donahue, who is over us. Mm. Yes. So, so basically, the, uh, the CEO is in charge of the business or, or in charge of the maintenance of the facility or mm -hmm. 
we can think about it that way. And and the because medical staff, like, we don't come under that. Medical staff does not come under that, but they work together. Who's going to hear the longest out of all teachers? Who's been hearing the longest out of all the teachers? That would be Mr. Sure. Shepherd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after Ms. Shepherd, that would be. No. No. Uh, Dr. Black, right? He's no, like teachers. Right, well, well, teachers, teacher, right. Yeah. So the yeah. shepherd, yeah. and then I think it's Mr. Actually, I'm not sure who came first between Mr. Donahue and Richard Worsworthy. I just blanked out, I can't remember. Um, and then myself, Ms. Adger, and then Ms. Bonilla. But Dr. Black has been here since the beginning of the school as well. He's just stepped down from his teaching position. He used to be a uh, quite an, a colorful teacher. <laughs> uh, and by colorful, I mean uh, like pitch black. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Mr. Dami, none of you have been there before sure. you said. Yes, Mr. Dami. So, I for radiog for radiography, yes, Mr. Donahue was part of the school before me. Teaching overall, I did start teaching MRI in 2016, so that was before Mr. Donahue came on. But for radiography, he is my senior. Okay, so hospital departments. Lots of, de lots of departments in the hospital, right? There's the obvious ones, right? Radiology, nursing, but then or respiratory therapy, right, anesthesia. But you've got the less um, popular ones, like EBS, right? Environmental sure. services, right, housekeeping. They're the ones that really keep the hospital running. Without EBS, the hospital would be a mess, both literally and figuratively. Okay. We have admissions. Um, we have health information management. We have human resources. So we do depend on all of these other departments, right? This is not an exhaustive list. You also have like building and coding. You have um, transportation. Trans yes, transportation, thank you. Transportation is a very important department. So HVAC. HR? Yes. HVAC, like like air air ventilation system. Oh HVAC, that? yes. Uh, engineering, hospital engineering. Yes, we both have normal engineering and biomedical engineering. What does hospital engineering mean? Hospital engineering, so they deal with the maintenance of the building. So air conditioning systems, lights, any structures, any power, plumbing issues, all of that falls under engineering. If I need the temperature of a room changed, I'm calling engineering. A lot of times in the surgery room, You'll hear the doctors complain that the room's too warm because you're moving a whole lot, and so the nurse will call engineering. Hey, we need to drop the surgery, put the surgery room down under three degrees. Right? They're the ones taking care of that. So then also you just said radiology is because we are doing radiology, right? Yep. Radiology, we are all under the radiology department. Okay, so speaking of the radiology department. It is also subdivided into different modalities. So we have diagnostic, which is x-ray. We have ultrasound, which is our friends next door. CT, right, computed tomography. MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. IR, also known as special procedures. This is our interventional radiology, right, our CVIT, for example. We may have nuclear medicine or PET. So each of these modalities right, may have its own budget, its own administration, its own staff. Right, we've got a manager for diagnostic, who's different from the manager of ultrasound, who's different from the manager of CT, who's different from the manager of MRI. So what's IR special procedures? IR is interventional radiology. Oh, it's not the image receptor. <laughs> different IR, <laughs> different IR. Yes? Mm -hmm. okay? Yes, correct. So IR special procedures. If you have ever noticed the room next to our lab room at LBJ, when they're doing they do cases in there, they have patients in there. 
that belongs to IR special procedures. So they do things like catheters, port placements, angiograms, all sorts of things. Who's the manager at Intel very well, Jane? Who's the manager at OJ? Hmm, okay, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> manager <laughs> Manager yes. for LBJ is like Michael something, right? That's the guy that. Uh, <laughs> so if we're talking about radiology, right? If we're talking about imaging, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about the directors of imaging. Mm -hmm. So at Pentop we have Mr. Hess. At LBJ we have Mr. Guillory. So these are the directors of imaging, our radiology leadership. So how much do we have to know this for exam? So you don't need to know the names. I'm not going to ask you their names. But you should know that, for example, the director is going to be in charge of the operation and organization of the department. Right? So they're going to be over everything in radiology. They report directly to senior administration, right? to, the, to the VP of operations or something like that. So underneath them would be individual managers for each department. Right? Over at LBJ, we have Ms. Robin, who handles X-ray. Um, over at Ben Taub, you have, well, it depends on which shift you have, right? You have, because, sorry, so Ms. Robin kind of handles things in the weekdays. You have um, Ms. Gwen, who is kind of like the lead tech who works under her. You've got Ms. Jeff Jones, who handles the weekends over at Bentop. You've got Ms. Monica Ashley, who's one of the managers for the weekday. You've got Mr. Abram Kurian, who is the weekend manager. You've got people for nights or evenings as well. So there is a lot of management, but they all fall under and report to the director. Some more things as far as radiology department goes. We do have support services, right? Registration, scheduling, informatics, and transportation. Yes, in general. And the job interview, would you meet them or they wouldn't like down What do you meet? These people here? Uh-huh. You may. You may. Um, let's see, I remember sitting in on one of their job interviews before and but it was for sonography, and one of the sonography direct for, and so Mr. Hess and then the sonography manager were both in the room there. So yes, they might show up in your interviews. So what could be our, our, our contact with them on a day-to-day basis if as a student? Um, you're probably not gonna see too much of them on a day-to-day -day basis. Mostly, they'll do a walkthrough of the department to make sure everything is running smoothly, make sure that there are no issues. But you're not going to be working directly with them day to day. Right? You're going to be working directly with the technologists instead. And they will know of us. They know that there are students. But they won't know. Uh, They're uh, probably not going to know your names. <laughs> <laughs> right? oh. You should give them a reason to know your names. Yes, <laughs> you should give them a reason to know your name. A positive, positive. reason. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. and you want to be you want to be the student that cleaned the entire department as soon as they walked in the door every single day for six months straight, right? You don't want to be the student who disappeared for two hours every day and nearly got themselves kicked up the program three times, <laughs> right? So, do leave a positive impression because technologists talk, and then you talk to their manager, and then managers talk, and they do end up talking to the directors. So names do filter their way up if they make a big enough impression. Let's make sure the impression is positive and not negative. Wait, for the support yes. service, can you go back? Would students be one of them? Students as uh, support services, so students would not count since they're not really a department. Oh, it's they based on departments? Correct. Mm -hmm. They have a kind of registration department, a scheduling department, informatics is a department, transportation is their own department. 
when the students are not at the front. You do, you do provide support, though. Don't say yourself. <laughs> you do provide support. Uh, Charles, is that Not for free. <laughs> kind of. So think of it as you're working to earn the discount on your tuition. Okay, so medical director responsible for overseeing the quality of patient care, clinical protocols, managing policies and procedures. You've got the department chair, links the department to the medical staff, right? So like, um, this is kind of like the bridge between the CEO and the hospital side to the doctors and the medical staff side. They are responsible for the full range of services that the medical staff provides. Radiologists, you've seen them before in the previous unit, right? These are the doctors who are the ones that read our films. The radiologists may practice alone or they may be part of a group practice. Okay? When in clinics and you're rotating through the hospitals, you will see many radiology residents. Okay, remember, residents are training in their specialty, but they are a fully fledged medical doctor. Okay, so residents are doctors already. They are just working to earn their specialization. So you have radiology residents who are specializing in reading medical images and doing procedures related to that. Okay. You'll meet residents for orthopedics. Right? When you go to surgery, you'll see orthopedic residents. You may see anesthesiology residents. When you go up and you do portable x-rays, you'll run into internal medicine residents. You'll run into all sorts of residents. Right? So just remember, residents are actually doctors. They're just working on their specialty. And beyond residency, right, doctors can even go into fellowships to further specialize. So they graduate four years of medical school, they become a doctor, they decide to do orthopedic medicine, right, spend another five years learning orthopedics, and then after that, they go into a fellowship for sports medicine, do another one to two years, and now they are a specialized sports medicine orthopedic doctor. That's what, like 11 years, 10, 11 years? That's bread. It's a lot, it's a lot. So now you know why they make so much money. Yeah, but sometimes they're all miserable, right? I am, I am not gonna judge their mental state. Although, although you can kind of judge their mental state in the operating room, depending on how they treat you. The more stressed they are, the less friendly they tend to be. The more stuck they are. That's a good mindset to have. That's a good mindset to have. Okay. And then um, over here we have the radiation safety officer. So the RSO, this is a very important position. You will need to remember this position because this title will show up multiple times in multiple classes. The RSO is responsible for monitoring the use of radiation, they're monitoring the use of radioactive materials, they're monitoring your radiation dose. So the RSO is either gonna be a physicist or they're gonna be a radiologist with some physics training. Okay. Their job is to make sure that radiation is being properly used in the hospital and that no one is going to be over radiated. So, for example, if you decided to be a silly goose and you took your badge and you left it underneath an x-ray machine, right? so this is a dose monitoring badge, right? You take your dose monitoring badge, you stick it under an x-ray machine and you shoot it 100 times so that it looks like you got a lot of those, it is gonna be your RSO that comes to talk to you and they're gonna say, all right, you're not allowed to work in the radiology department anymore because you've gotten too much dose, right? You have surpassed your annual dose, you're not allowed in this department until 
you've had time to recover. Okay. If you get pregnant while working as a, an X-ray technologist, the RSO is the person that you will talk to to kind of manage how you handle the pregnancy and balance it with your work. They're going to be giving you a second radiation dash to monitor the fetus, the baby. You're going to be working with them as they do checkups on you to make sure that your dose does not go too high. So RSO is very, very important to us in radiology. The RSO for us in Hair South, I believe, is still Dr. Benjamin Archer. Yes? So, um, a couple of questions. So, for somebody by I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but there's like these, like, can we wear shirts underneath our scrub that, like, I guess reflect or bounce off the radiation? They have, like, lead, lead shirts? Is, yeah. Mm. Can you? You could. Do you need to? No, you do not need to. No. Unless you are working in a very in radiation intense area, I would say no, you do not need to worry about that. If you work in like IR? If you work in IR, right, you could consider that. But normally in IR, you would just wear your outer radiation apron instead. It would come with a thyroid protector, and that would be all the protection that you need. Wouldn't need a second layer on this. So, did your record of this uh, recording of your level of radiation ever stop you from working for a while? Myself? No. Because the radiation limits are so high that unless you've done something extremely irresponsible, you should never come close to approaching your annual radiation limit. So does the radiation limit wear out? So it is annual. So yes, each year will be the limits will be will be different, right? So you can hit the limit for one year, but not the limit for the next year. So it wears out basically, sir. But yeah, just for that. example, I was in an automobile accident and I had millions of X-rays mm -hmm. and CT scans and everything. So would that still live with me for that as long as I live? Are you asking about the effects from the radiation? Yes, sir. So that yes. times when I when you see the monitoring saying how much radiation I have in me, would it show up in the Okay, so radiation does not stay in you. Radiation does not stay in you. If you get an X-ray, the X-rays do not stay in your body. The X-rays last only as long as the button is held down. As soon as the button is off, X-rays are off, there are no more X-rays in that room. Not in your body, not in the machine. They are all gone, okay? So, when you have the radiation monitor, it will not tell you anything about past X-rays that you got when you did not have the monitor, right? If before I joined the program, I had walked through a nuclear war zone, and then I come and I put this monitor on, it would not tell me about that radiation. It will only tell me about radiation while I am currently wearing it. So, radiation itself, with exceptions, but when dealing with x-rays, x-rays do not stay in the body. Right? You will not become radioactive if you receive too many x-rays or too many CT scans. Um, now, the damage caused by radiation, including x-rays and CT, yes. That damage, that change is potentially permanent, okay? But the radiation itself is not, right? You do not become a source of radiation just because you receive x-rays. So, so if the radiation has affected you, it will show up on you? If the radiation has affected you, you may show symptoms of the radiation but it will not show up on your badge unless you are wearing the badge when you receive the radiation. Does that make sense? Is there a limit for like patients as well? Or yes. We have population limits and we have occupational limits. Mm. Occupational limits are actually much lower than 
population limits. Hmm. Because, as written in the occupation, it's expected that you're exposed to X-rays or radiation more often within a shorter time period. So the dose limits for us are lower. And even with that lower dose limit, it should be almost impossible to reach that dose limit if you are doing things properly. Okay, so as long as you're not standing right next to the x-ray machine, every single time you're shooting your patient, as long as you're not holding things, as long as you're not running around without lead on, you should never reach your occupational dose limit. I yes. apologize, you might have already said this, but um, do we receive a new dosimeter every year? Mm, good question. Uh, most dosimeters, for example, like this one, or the one I have, they are quarterly. So oh. every three months okay. we change them out. Okay. So these are even color coded. So you'll get like yellow, blue, green, and red or something like that. So it's that much harder to really max out your like annual or the badge thing, whatever. Well, the, so the badge, I mean, so across the four quarters, right, they'll add them up and that will be your annual dose. Because they become not that, they, they're not any more productive after three months? No, it's just that that's how often we switch them out. Just, to, just so that there's no risk in, so that, why would you want to change them? Because they don't work after three months? Or because well, they get spoiled or they get... We need to send them off for reading. Nice. Right? These don't change color or anything when you receive too much radiation. Okay, so after three months, they send it to a company. company checks the badges. They tell you how much radiation you received in those three months. This is not a real-time monitor. Right? So you need to wait for results. Oh, yellow. Oh, yellow just means that this is for the summer. And it doesn't and it doesn't come back to you once it goes for checking. Correct. Only the records come back to you. Only the records come back. Once I send this off, I have a new one, I stick it on here, and I go for another three months. Okay. So any questions about radiology leadership here? Do we need to pay for that? Uh, no, you do not need to pay for the dosimeters. That should be provided by your facility. If you lose your dosimeter, then that's a different story. <laughs> that I do not know. I have not lost a dosimeter. <laughs> oh. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, considered PPE, is why they provide it? Um, this is, I would not consider this PPE. This does not actually protect you from anything. This only monitors things. Okay. So once you're done, we have to buy our um, so, yes, when you begin working as a technologist, you do need your own markers. Your markers cannot have the small s that indicates you're a student. So, depending on where you work, they might be kind enough to provide you with markers, or you would need to go off and buy your own. Are they expensive, like, over here outside? Uh, last time I had to buy markers, it was $50 for two pairs. Yeah, they are the fancy markers with those beads inside. Well, uh, that was like eight years ago. <laughs> so did you change your marker? I mean, you can find them on Etsy and stuff. Yeah, so. yeah like yeah. Etsy. Yeah. 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 Like two ones. pairs is already four pieces, right? That's Perfect. just a spare in case you lose it. Correct. So I got a uh, normal set and I got a spare. This is actually my spare set right now. So those you don't ever. So I don't need to replace these markers unless I lose them. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about other places or other healthcare settings outside of the hospital, right? So we all know about the hospital because we've talked about it a lot, but we also have outpatient clinics or as we call them, ambulatory care centers. So this is the sort of place where you would have like an appointment with a family doctor and you go in, right? So, not a hospital setting. Okay, physician's office. Right? So instead of a clinic with a whole bunch of different facilities, it might just be a physician's office with just a doctor and a few basic things. Right, and then if he needs anything, he would send you out to a different area, like to an imaging center. 
right, to get your pictures done. So did you say clinics were called ambulatory? Ambulatory care centers yes. or ambulatory care services. Right. Ambulatory, what does that mean? Mo mobile, sir. Right, mobile, able to walk, right? So basically, for walking, patients that are able to walk in. Okay, mobile imaging. Um, you may sometimes see that there are people that drive around with like these like giant trucks with like mobile imaging on them, right? So kind of like a portable imaging center. Yes, that's right. M mobile mammography is a very popular one. Um, we even technically have a mobile MRI machine in that, just imagine like an 18 wheeler, right? <laughs> one of those tractor trailers. And so imagine inside that trailer, on one end is an MRI machine, and then the remaining like 10% of the trailer, you've got a small office for the technologist, and then there's like a door on the side of the trailer that you can walk up into. Um, we actually have one of these over at Ventop right now. They usually just drive it over, they park it, hook it up to power, and then it operates as kind of like a standalone room. Okay, urgent care centers. These are very, uh, very popular nowadays. You may have seen them pop up all around, right? Emergency care centers, urgent care centers. Oftentimes they have their own imaging as well. They usually don't have their own radiologists, right? They usually contract with a radiologist somewhere else to read the films. Outpatient surgical centers, okay? It's kind of similar. These are like same day surgery clinics where someone can go get surgery and then be out the same day, no extended ICU stays. And then industry research, so working with vendors or working in research. Um, I had a previous student who ended up working for MD Anderson, not as a technologist, but as a research assistant, where they would try and create new MRI protocols to see different kinds of cancer. And they would run the or help set up the MRI machine and help set up the techniques used for that research. Okay, so that's something else that you might see. Or vendors, right, the people who sell us the equipment. Normally you go up, you work, you gain experience, you get hired on, you go to a company like Toshiba, GE, Siemens, get hired on as a vendor, and then you travel around to different locations, different hospitals that are looking to upgrade their equipment and you try and sell your company's equipment to them. It's like, look at this brand new portable machine that we have, it's got all these cool new features. Or look at this new CR, or look at this new overhead x-ray unit we have that can move by itself, right? And so you would help sell that to different locations. Lots of different things related to healthcare not just hospitals. Okay, management. Um, if we're talking about management, I know a lot of times you think, okay, guy sits in the office all day, answers emails, answers phone calls, has meetings, right? Kind of true. Um, but what is management really involved in? It usually involves stuff dealing with quality. So they do planning, organization, they do staffing, direction, controlling, coordinating. But a lot of their things in the hospital setting comes down to quality improvement, quality management, performance improvement. So if you're interested in making sure that the hospital and the department stays up to certain standards, not just in basic care, but things like turnaround times making sure that patients are done in a timely manner, okay, making sure that exams don't stay waiting for too long. Okay. So, what are they doing when they do planning? Well, they're determining the course of action for the future. What is the future of this department? Okay. So, by planning, this enables the co 
coordinated and consistent fulfillment of goals and objectives. If you know where you're trying to go, it's a lot easier to go there. If you're not sure where you're gonna go, you end up taking detours and you end up getting lost and there's a lot of wasted time, energy, and resources. So planning is very important from the management perspective. Organizing and facilitating. So identifying how to carry out goals and objectives. So this is creating a framework to determine what activities should be done and who has what responsibility. And so if we have a plan, we now need to be able to organize things to carry out this plan. So organization gives you a framework, gives you an idea of what should be done and who should be doing it. Okay, staffing. Staffing is very important nowadays because there is a staffing shortage. I was talking to a manager earlier today and they told me that they are hurting for CT techs, MAMO techs, and even just normal imaging technologists. Right? So staffing is something that they are really trying to work on. Okay? Staffing involves not just getting people into positions, but getting the right people with the right skills into the right positions. Right? And this also includes helping people develop their skills to perform even better. Okay? So staffing, we wanna make sure that when we hire someone, they are not only able to do the job, but they fit into the culture or the work environment. Right? And then, of course, if we notice that they have skills that are lacking in certain areas, we want to be able to train them in those areas to help them perform better. Okay. What else does management do? Directing. They get employees to put in the effort needed to perform the required work. Influence, guide, persuade, coach, cheerlead, right? They're basically cheerleaders. Right? They should not be a drill sergeant. They should not just be barking orders at the people they are managing. Right? Managers should explain why and how. Right? Why are you doing this? How do I expect you to do this? But they shouldn't just be telling you, go do this. Right? And their job is to delegate work. So their boss tells them, okay, we need this done. The job of the manager is now to figure out who should be doing what in order to get that thing done. All right, controlling. Management is there to determine how to achieve goals, how we measure progress towards those goals, right? And perform corrections when necessary, if we're not heading towards that goal. Okay, so we've got different things like performance standards. We have guidelines, we have key performance indicators, things that kind of let the manager know how well the department is progressing towards the goal. Coordination, process of achieving orderly group activities and a unity of effort. Requires strong communication skills, right? It's easy to do stuff by yourself, it's hard to do stuff as a group because you need everybody in the group on the same page, right? You need everyone on the group working together, right? But these people here are just working together, sho shoveling dirt from the ground floor to the roof of the third story. <laughs> pretty impressive if you ask me. Some pretty good coordination there. Okay, so orderly group effort. And now, regulators. Who is looking over the hospital? Who is making sure the hospital is doing what it is supposed to do? Right? For the school, JSER is the one that looks over us, right? They're the ones that set the guidelines as to how the school should be performing. For the hospital, because they're not a school, they're a hospital, instead they just have the joint commission. So the Dread Commission is the one that provides accreditation and performs on-site visits. Here at Harris South, our accreditation comes from 
the D and V, the North P Veritas. Okay, so we used to use the joint commission, but we switched over to D and V to do our accreditation. They are a different accreditation agency. Right? But the goal is still the same thing, to make sure the hospital is performing up to certain standards. If the DNB says that we need to make adjustments, if they notice that we're doing things wrong or inefficiently, then they will let us know. We basically get a report card from them. And then we need to make sure to make changes, make fixes, before they show up again the next time. Yes. I'm, I'm still confused with my this thing. J E C R T does the accreditation for radiology or the E R R T does? J sir, J R C E R T does accreditation for the school. A R R T does certification for a person. So this is the same with the J D C Joint Commission. Yes. So the Joint Commission does accreditation for a hospital. So the Joint Commission, the TJC, will not do accreditation for the school. That's up to the JCERT. Right? Slightly different. Joint Commission is not for hospitals. Yes, the Joint Commission, DNB also only for hospitals. Right? DNB will not accredit the school. That is up to JCERT. DNB accredits hospitals. What do you mean? Like the joint commission to DNB. Mm. So like they, they do the same thing when they switch. Yeah. Usually it's going to do with something like cost because they charge us for accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the amount or Funding. how they ask for materials or how they do their site visits. Um, this was something that administration decided, right, which is way above my pay grade because back then I was just an X-ray tech. So all they told me was, trade commission's not coming anymore. Instead, it's the DMV. And you're going to be here next month, so start cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hold on, wait, what do you mean by cleaning? They're like, well, you see, the DMV visited this, this other place the other day, and they were like, your radiology department cannot be using tape on markers. It is an infection control hazard and you've left tape residue all over your equipment. And we walked over to the imaging, the wall detector, and sure enough, our wall detector also had the tape gluey residue on like the quarters. Like, all right, time to get cleaning. Scrape, 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 scrape. <laughs> In between patients, just scrape. <laughs> so much scraping. Yes, there's so much tape all over the place. They're like, trade commission says you cannot have things posted up on your walls unless they're laminated or sorry, DMV said you can't have things posted on your walls. They're not laminated because it's a fire control hazard. It's a fire safety hazard. All right, so take down all of the papers, things that we have, all of the um, manuals, all of the technique charts. Like, all right, well, I guess we gotta laminate these now. Half of them never got laminated, so. <laughs> the walls are pretty empty now, okay, but that is the job of the DNB or the Joint Commission. They go around, they do checks of the hospitals, and they tell you what you can improve on, how you can do better, you as being the hospital. Okay, we also have state health departments. These provide oversight of licensing practices and radiation safety. They maintain a certificate of need program if applicable. Certificate of need is there to make sure that we don't have too many radiology departments for too few people. Right? If we want to open a new radiology department, or we're gonna add in a whole bunch of new machines, we need to show that there is demand for those departments or machines. I can't just suddenly throw in 100 new x-ray centers in Houston, unless I can show to the state department that we have a short supply of imaging and we need these like radiology departments. Does that make sense? So that's our certificate of need. OSHA, right? Everyone knows OSHA. They're there to make sure that the workplace is safe. It deals with hand handling of hazardous materials. Hazardous materials can include radioactive materials. 
And OSHA also deals with standard precautions. Yes, Jay. So are radiation safety officers gonna be through OSHA or? Radiation they... safety officer is hospital staff. Okay. But they will work with other agencies like that are managing that. Okay. Right? OSHA could be one of them. OSHA being one of them. Okay. CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is another big one. Okay. If you want to scare people at the hospital, don't yell fire. <laughs> yell either DMV or yell CMS. And that will get people running. Okay? <laughs> Um, CMS requires suppliers of equipment to be accredited to receive reimbursement. Okay, so the ones who supply us with the equipment, they need to have accreditation as well. For hospitals, hospitals must be in compliance to receive Medicare Medicaid payment. If they're not in compliance with CMS, then this funding gets cut off. Okay, and that is a big deal. Um, ben Todd, for example, a few years back had a run-in with CMS <laughs> where they nearly cited us. We, got in, we were about to get in very big trouble. So we had to do a lot of things to get ourselves back into compliance with CMS. So these are the ones that help look over the different hospitals to make sure the hospitals are maintaining certain standards. Finally, we have HIPAA, the <laughs> Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. If you look at the abbreviation, right? H-I-P-A-A, -A, one P, two A's. This is not a HIPAA with two P's. <laughs> Right? HIPAA is not HIPPO. If you see anyone spell HIPAA H-I-P-P-A, you know that they do not work in healthcare. I do. I just spelled it as H-I-P-P-A, so. <laughs> I just didn't oh. make it, I can't even find it out. Don't work in oh. healthcare. <laughs> now you know it is H-I-P-A-A. -A. Right? A-A. So, HIPAA, it was a law passed by Congress that sets standards for the protection of personal health information, PHI. PHI is protected information. You are not allowed to share the PHI of patients. You cannot obtain the PHI of patients without permission of that individual. Access to patient files is monitored. Inappropriate access may lead to termination. I don't know if any of you remember, but about, I wanna say eight years ago, there was a senator from Arizona, I think her name was Giffords, who got shot at a rally. And they brought her here to Houston to do physical therapy at Memorial Hermann. Well, a few people decided that they would be nosy and try to check her chart, which contains her PHI. All those people were immediately terminated. They were kicked out of the hospital system because PHI is protected. You cannot view it unless you have a reason to be looking for it. Yes. The Guns. people who got kicked out, are they like people that work at the hospital or random people? Worked at the hospital. They were hospital employees that abused their position to look into a patient's records without permission and without reason. They had no healthcare reason to be looking in the records. They had no permission to be looking in the records. They only checked it because it was a famous person. And so they were terminated. HIPAA violations, if you want to get fired, this is an easy way to do so. Yes. Does this stay in your background? Does this stay in your background? Um, that's a good question. That I do not know. What I can say is that the imaging community is quite small or quite close-knit. News travels fast. 
So if you do something in one place, it's very likely that three hospitals down, they will know about it by the time lunch comes around. <laughs> right? um, the hospital is a really close community. Right? The healthcare radiology community is pretty close. Right. So remember, it is HIPAA, not HIPPA. Um, I know that HIPAA was in the news, um, I think, a few months to a year back because there was some question about whether HIPAA applied to vaccination status, right? HIPAA only applies to us as medical professionals, right? And applies to us whether or not we can share other patients' medical information or access other patients' medical information. Right? You voluntarily reporting your medical information is not a HIPAA violation. Yes, Jay. Would it be a HIPAA violation if they require you to divulge your, uh, your medical information before you work there or whatever? Like if it's not like an infectious control hazard or let's say like you have a uh, skin condition you don't want people to know about or whatever. It may be some other sort of issue, but it's not gonna be a HIPAA issue. I see. So, yes. is it, uh, when you said, uh, is, is it correct to say HIPAA applies to people who work in medical organizations? Yes. Only? That, mm -hmm. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Okay, are we okay with HIPAA? So, if on the exam, you have two answer choices. One of them is HIPAA. One of them is HIPPA. Which answer choice are you going to choose? The first one. Double, Double A. Double A. Okay, very good. So no one should miss that. Right. Internal agencies. So the hospital itself has agencies as well, right? It's not just outside agencies monitoring the hospital. We have internal agencies as well. For example, we have the safety committee. Right, so this educates employees on safety policies and procedures. This monitors adverse drug effects and medical errors. Right, so these are the hospital employees as part of the committee that are doing this. We have infection control committees. Infection control, very important. You will have people on the infection control committee that you do not know are on the infection control committee. They will be going around acting like a normal person acting like a normal nurse or something, just going about their day, and then out of the corner of their eye, they notice that you walk into a patient's room without washing your hands. As soon as you walk out, you're there with a the clipboard. Name and department, please. Name, ID number, department. All right, I'm gonna send this to your manager that you did not wash your hands before going in the patient's room, right? Infection control, it's very important. Always make sure you are following infection control policies. Radiation Safety Committee, right, involves the RSO, Pharmacy and Therapeutics, Risk Management, Corporate Compliance. Final one down here, we have Picture Archiving and Communication Systems. The book throws this in with the agencies and committees, but to be honest, this isn't an agency. This is just a type of digital software system that lets us store pictures as digital images rather than physical film. Right, so if you ever are watching a medical drama and they've got film stuck to a, white, a light board, you know that is some old stuff. <laughs> because we don't use that anymore. Right? We all use packs so we can display our images on a computer screen. Okay. Final thing, goals for students and employees. Your number one goal is to take care of the patient. You're here for the customer, your customers are the patients, <coughs> but your customer is also the physician as well. Okay, so your customers are the patients, your customer is the physician. What do you mean the physician? Right? Because what you're doing, you're doing for the patient, but you're also doing for the doctor. Right, so both the patient and your doctor are your customers. Like they're ordering things from you or they're requesting things from you, you are giving things to them. Like they are your customers, they are the ones you're trying to please. Okay. As far as hiring goes, when you are looking to get hired, a recruiter will be screening you 
to make sure you meet the minimum job requirements. If you do, they will pass you on to the hiring manager. The hiring manager has background in the department, so they know what they are looking for. So they're gonna be doing interviews based on your ability to do what the job requires. During the interview, this is a great chance for you to describe your experience, right? Be specific, have examples when you go into your interview about how you handle situations, okay? Be able to demonstrate that you're familiar with the work. Act like you know what X-ray is about, because you should after two years. <laughs> okay, goals. You want to be able to see your work from the patient's or the doctor's point of view. So don't give yourself excuses like, well, that was a difficult patient, therefore these images are fine, they're good enough. Right? Good enough for you, but if you look at it from the patient's point of view or the doctor's point of view, can the doctor actually see what they're looking for? Will that image help diagnose or help the patient? Right? So. Make sure you are looking at your images from the view of your customers. Be skillful in handling customer concerns, whether it's the doctor or the patient. Service with a smile, right? I know we're wearing masks, but always be smiling. That's gonna be part of your lab test of Braden, in fact. Do you smile? <laughs> you think I'm joking, but I'm not. You're <laughs> actually graded on smiling during no, lab test. But now we are okay because we well, don't have to, to, I'll have to take the mask off. Okay. Or I'll listen for the smile in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you smile. I smile in your eyes. Um, really? Yeah, that is true. That is true. <laughs> Respond assuming the customer is right. right. Assume the patient or the doctor knows what they're talking about. Meet or exceed expectations of the customer. All right. All right, this is all customer service stuff. Critical thinking, be a team player. Be familiar with your department. All aspects of your department. So in the fall, when you go to the clinical sites, learn how to do everything. Yes, your key focus will be on, can I position the patient? Can I do my PA chest x-ray? Can I do my lateral chest x-ray? However, you should be learning how to do everything else as well. How do I work the computer? How do I work the console? How do I set up my technique, my x-ray energies? How do I track my patient? How do they check in? How do they check out? How do they get moved around the hospital? Be familiar with everything. So if you get asked a question, you're able to answer it. If someone is missing, if they take off one day, you're able to follow up, fill in. Right? You want to be able to know how everything in the department works. Okay, and that does end us in chapter six for us as well.